Again, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're located. We'll get started at about 1.45. Um, so if you wanna grab some water, go use the bathroom, we encourage you to do so. We know it's been a long morning or long afternoon. And if you are joining this forum because you are excited, thank you. We're excited to present Show that you as well. right now. Do you want to return? Yeah, so thank you for joining us. And if you accidentally click on our forum, we're happy to have you as well. Right? And, and you can stay with us and chat with us Here and learn a little bit about our work. Choose from. So you can choose one of those. we're getting some more people. We'll get started in about a minute. And again, thank you for joining us. So I'm looking at like, I want to look at. And if you can, please mute yourselves um, as you're joining. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we'll, buy, we'll get started in about one minute. Thank you for joining us. If you have time, grab some coffee or maybe a cup of water, um, a glass of orange juice if you're still in the morning and if, if you're still in the East Coast, right here we're in um, the West Coast, so it's the afternoon for us. It's getting you, we're getting used to the time. And um, if you're, Excited for this forum. This is the role of, of community health workers in uplifting maternal mental health. And, and you were excited to see us uh, introduce ourselves and tell you a little bit about us. Um, we're excited as well. And again, if you accidentally click, that's okay. Like we invite you and welcome you to come and um, spend some time with us. Next slide, please be. So you will we'll get started. I am joined um, today by my colleagues, Claire Friedrich and Elizabeth Sauner. Uh, Claire is a maternal child health project director at CAI and she's worked in clinical and nonprofit setting as a health educator, lactation counselor, and facilitator of support groups and group care for perinatal um, women. So Claire, give a quick wave so you see her a little bit more. And Elizabeth, who is a project director at CAI and also has a private practice as a clinical social worker. Um, much of her focus has been around reproductive and adolescent health. And myself, my name is Teresa Furman. I am the maternal and infant health trainer and um, breastfeeding specialist at CAI. Um, I've worked as a lactation specialist and nutrition educator for women, infant, and children. And I also want to acknowledge that we have B. Marie, who is helping <laughs> with some of our tech needs today. So if you have any tech issues in the group um, and in and, and the forum, you can just send her and send them a private message and they will help you. And um, now that we've introduced ourselves, we want to tell you a little bit about CAI and are known as Chicotelli Associates. Uh, it is a diverse mission-driven nonprofit dedicated to improving the quality of healthcare and social services delivered to priority population across the country. Uh, we, do, we do this uh, through training and technical assistance, curriculum development, continuing education, distance learning, and more. And CAI has been um, the statewide training center for the New York State Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for WIC, uh, designing and delivering training and technical assistance programs to local WIC agency staff. Um, we've also worked with federal, state, and um, <clears throat> local health departments to train different community-based uh, health workers in a variety of public health uh, areas from COVID response, um, HIV, substance use, and even more. 
So skill building among frontline staff is our domain. It's, it's our bread and butter, right? And we're excited to be able to share and present a new maternal depression um, training that we've created. And now that we've you've heard a little bit about us, we want to hear from you. So you can chat in your name, uh, your role, and where you are joining from. We're excited to know that you're joining from everywhere. Like we're saying, we're here in New York City. So um, thank you for joining us. And we want to know a little bit more about you. So if you could chat in your name, your role, and where you are joining us from, that would be great. And I'll give it a few. Oh, the answer is coming in fast. Hi, welcome Susie or N. And you're joining us from Nevada, Nevada. Sorry, I do have four languages on my tongue and sometimes I pronounce things very weirdly. And I apologize for that ahead of time. It's like somebody that's from the South that pronounce things funny. That's me right now, okay? Um, welcome Carrie, project director. Heather, Dana, Tori, welcome. And I'm seeing people from Wisconsin, California. Um, sorry, Illinois, Washington, DC. Wow, that's great. Welcome, Ashley, Teresa. Thank you for joining us. We're, we appreciate it. From Oakland, oh, wow, okay. I hope, um, oh, Mass Ashley from Massachusetts. I used to live in Massachusetts hate the weather out there <laughs> right um hopefully you're having a good day like a better day because i know the snowy weather out there is gets a little hectic uh welcome claire yvette jennifer and and i'm sorry if i'm missing some of you the answers are coming in pretty fast and and welcome we appreciate you joining us from ev from all over the country Oh, uh, Jamie, Ashley, again, another, oh, not snowing today, thankfully. Oh, nice. <laughs> and then nice, I just used to love the snowy weather just for the um, uh, no school days, right? All right, so we'll move forward. Continue bring, um, giving us your welcome. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We're just gonna keep moving uh, forward. And by the end of this session, participants will be able to some of our objectives today is for you to discuss cultural belief and deep rooted issues of stigma surrounding mental health care, uh, and also describe the importance of community health work in supporting and educating um, mothers with maternal depression. And people can chat in your questions throughout um, the forum, and we'll do our best to get to them at the end of our session of our presentation. Next slide, please. So some of the terminology we I wanna we wanna talk about that a little bit, right? Because maternal depression is a medical illness um, that can affect any mother. And the term maternal depression encompasses a range of conditions that can affect a woman during pregnancy and up to a year um, postpartum. And other terms you may know or see um, uh, in your work is perinatal, perinatal depression, postpartum depression, um, baby blues, and some more severe terms are postpartum psychosis or PMAS, which stands for perinatal and postpartum mood and anxiety disorder. And we recognize the importance of supporting women and families in a way that considered the complexity of their culture and of identifying the language that works best for them, right? For example, Depression may bring up concern of having a serious mental illness, whereas stress may more accurately uh, represent how a client experience, um, their, experiences their emotions. Um, this also addressed the need um, for non-judgmental and creating a space, a safe space for such discussion. And we also want to um, talk about terms uh, related to gender identity, right? because we acknowledge that not all perinatal uh, clients or patients identify with terms like women, mother, or even the pronouns of she and her. And we've made the decision to talk about maternal depression rather than perinatal depression uh, because it's more widely common in those communities, right? And with that being said, Elizabeth is going to give us a brief overview of maternal depression and dive into some of the literature around our topic today. 
Great, thanks, Teresha. So yeah, we want to give a, just a brief overview. We know many of you have been at this forum already for a day and a half or so. And you know, we've been talking a lot about maternal depression and maternal mental health. Um, so we want to just give a, a brief overview of this emerging public health priority in maternal and child health. And so to get us even thinking about that further, we're going to ask for your participation in doing a poll. There's going to be a poll that's going to pop up. It has three different questions. I'll read them out loud, but answer, there'll be myth and fact questions. So we'll go through each, all three of them. So women of all racial and ethnic backgrounds get diagnosed with and experience maternal depression in the same way. Is that a fact or a myth? Then we have number two, which is all women have equal access to mental health services and treatment during and following pregnancy, myth or fact. And then the third question is pregnant women's risk of depression nearly doubled after the pandemic struck, myth or fact. Great, I'm getting great participation. Wait just a few more seconds. All right, All right, we can close it up. Okay, so now we're sharing the results. Hopefully you can all see this. So we had about 96% of you say the first one was a myth that women of all racial and ethnic backgrounds get diagnosed with and experience maternal depression in the same way. And that is correct, it is a myth. We know very clearly from research that racial disparities remain stark with black women experiencing rates of maternal depression that are roughly twice the right rate of white women. And we also know that mental health services are severely lacking. So you are all spot on. Number two, all women have equal access to mental health services and treatment during and following pregnancy. 100% of you said that this was a myth and you are correct. Cost, insurance, screening, stigma, lack of culturally humble, Mental health services all create barriers, especially for women, women of color, black women, and indigenous women. And number three, a pregnant woman's risk of depression nearly doubled after the pandemic. And that is definitely a fact. We've seen these rates, you know, I think anecdotally among the people that you serve, among the people that we serve. And we also have noted it through research, through a bunch of research that has come out as recent as January, 2022. So we know there is a growing understanding of not only how pervasive and harmful maternal depression can be, but also of the relationship between historical and contemporary racism, discrimination, barriers in healthcare, housing, labor, and other systems, and the social determinants of health and maternal depression. So we know all of these can confound and impact maternal mental health. And so this is one of the reasons why we're talking about this super important topic of including community health workers in this work. So again, to look at some of what the literature says on the next slide, we have about um, that 20% of women of color report anxiety and depression during anxiety or during pregnancy, excuse me. Uh, we know that Black and Latinx women are twice as likely as women to experience postpartum depressive symptoms. And again, the pandemic exacerbated this. We have seen this, that mental health issues have been on the rise across the board. And we know that mental health services are just not as readily available um, as, as our communities need them to be. Just as the, the rise of uh, increased rates have increased, the increase in uh, access to services has not. So the number of people who experience mental maternal depression are just estimates. They're based on who is actually diagnosed by a, a healthcare provider. So we know that there are many, many other mothers, parents, caregivers that are not diagnosed, that fall through the cracks and are not identified as having maternal depression and nor do they receive treatment. And as I mentioned, the two most common reasons people don't receive care for maternal depression and mental health in general is because of cost and social stigma. 
uh, we know that this is really concerning because those who need postpartum mental health care the most are often the least likely to receive it. And so we know that this increases these health disparities in the communities where we live, where we work, and where we thrive. And so to, to address the health disparities, we wanted to be sure which of the health disparities are really the most pervasive specifically for men, maternal depression. And so community health workers, which we'll get into in a little while, are often those who serve, uh, serve clients, serve people in communities that are most likely to experience maternal depression based on the previous risk factors we just discussed. So women of color, including African-American women, uh, Asian-American, Native American, multiracial, and other non-white individuals are less likely to be screened for depression compared with white women. So during that postpartum period. So for folks that are going to their uh, postnatal appointments, they're often not getting screened. And we also know that screenings are not always culturally responsive and may not capture a client's experience of depression or anxiety. Some may not screen positive for depression and fall through the cracks. As Teresha mentioned, the term depression may not resonate with all people who experience a mental health concern. We also know there are major differences in access to maternal mental health care as well. In the United States, it can be very expensive to receive mental health care, even with insurance. And overall, we know that people of color and people from low income communities are more likely to be uninsured. Women of color particularly are at increased risk of being uninsured prior to their pregnancy and may lose coverage at the end of their 60 day Medicaid postpartum coverage period, of course, depending on where they live. So getting, getting into that stigma piece, we know that admitting to needing help or treatment can lead to discrimination. It can be uncomfortable and it can really affect someone's self-esteem. Stigma can also cause family relationship problems, create barriers to getting a job or housing, and admitting to having a maternal depression diagnosis may impact and create barriers in those different areas. We know that oftentimes providers and institutions can also engage in stigmatizing behaviors and policies. For example, we know that research has shown for communities of color, being open about mental health symptoms can lead to being labeled, can lead to being marginalized and misdiagnosed which can also lead to an individual internalized sense of stigma. So addressing these health disparities is a really big job and we know access and cost are major factors in these disparities. The reality is mental health services are lacking. And so one way that we, we've addressed and wanting to continue to work alongside of addressing these gaps and strengthening the source of the community and cultural support is through the use and, and talent of community health workers. So I'll let Teresha kind of follow us through what is a community health worker and how they do their work. Thank you, Elizabeth. And when we're talking about uh, the term community health worker, we're broadly speaking about promotora de salud, um, healthy start home visitors, case managers, um, family workers, and other health educators who are working with pregnant and uh, parenting clients. And we designed this training for the community health workers because we recognize that they, they have a, a, a big engagement in their community, right? And, 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 they're in, and the need for that engagement um, a community health workforce is identifying, supporting, and educating mothers and families to address maternal depression, especially women who identify as Black, Indigenous women, um, Hispanic, and other communities of color. And communities of health workers are uniquely um, positioned to build um, trust and report with these community, uh, with these clients that that they that they see, and to to be able to address barriers um, 
to seeking care and reducing the stigma that Elizabeth was talking about associated with receiving um, mental health care. And research suggests that support and that, that peer influence and the presence and connection has incredible positive um, impact and power in those communities. We know that only half of mothers, like Elizabeth stated, um, experiencing depression symptoms actually receive treatment, right? And given the reality of the stigma and cultural responses to these issues, uh, building on community health workers' knowledge and trusted status in their communities and um, equipping them with the tools to respond effectively to those barriers is an innovative approach to maternal depression. And when their clients may feel more comfortable talking about those stigmatized um, topics that they may not feel comfortable or get an opportunity to talk about with their providers. And community health workers really get to know their clients over time, um, often in their homes, and they are all well suited to help identify, support, educate, and refer clients with maternal depression because of the trust, report, and the connection that they develop. So these four verbs that I've said, identify, support, educate, and refer, has kind of become a mantra of sorts for this project. And identify, a community health worker can recognize that a client um, may, may be experiencing maternal depression based on signs and symptoms, verbal and nonverbal cues, right? And <clears throat> and support, they listen, they hold space, um, make clients feel they are safe, right? And are not at fault for experiencing feelings of depression because the mom may not know that this is not normal for her to feel. And, and having that community health worker there to provide that support is very important. Um, one of the things we know about community health workers that see these clients is that their relationship are more intimate with the client because they're spending one to two hours talking to these clients. So you're learning a little bit more about the client, right? Um, um, and we know that they get more information and more opportunities to talk about these topics, which we know is much more longer than a typical doctor's appointment. And typically, um, the the intimacy of this relationship when clients and the and the time that they spend with community health worker is it means so much more and they're able to connect and they the client trusts the community health workers and open up more than a provider and that intimate um relationship it can take a provider years to build or if not in some of these communities they don't get to see that same provider um for every visit, right? So it's hard to build that relationship with that provider. And in the educate, um, they can provide up-to-date information on maternal depression to promote positive pregnancy experience, right? And through that, the client can improve mental health literacy. And they can possibly even conduct a quick exercise and come up with ideas or safety plans for the client. Because imagine if this client is by themselves, you know, they need to know what to do, who to call, um, what to do in the case of emergency, because they may not be aware of that. Um, and, and, and that educate portion, that's where the community health worker can help them. And, and of course, community health workers can refer as needed after consulting with their supervisors, they can um, make appropriate referrals for services that they don't provide in, in, in their program. For example, it could be a support group, a therapy session, or even refer them, referring them to OBGYN. And community health workers are already improving access to care, quality care, and, and health equity in underserved um, communities. And we know how valuable their work is and we want to push for their engagement to address maternal depression. And Claire is going to expand on how we, the trainers, yeah. would introduce or conduct our training for that. If Thank you. We're just going to ask that folks mute in, in case you accidentally hit that unmute or just joined. Thank you. 
there's a whole bunch of us. Anything we can do to control a little bit of that background noise. So as Tricia said, we, we are, this is our bread and butter, working with frontline staff, working with community health workers. Elizabeth, Tricia, uh, and, and a more expanded team of us at CAA have worked with community health workers in a lot of different sectors of healthcare. And what we really started to hear, you know, even pre-pandemic, but at the onset of the pandemic, what we were hearing over and over from community health workers, case managers, home visitors, folks on the ground, was that moms were not doing okay. The pandemic, this, this confluence of so many issues was really having an impact. And many of them were feeling like they were coming up empty or not feeling super confident in delving into conversations around how mothers and families were doing in terms of their, their mental health. So this was part of what really spurred on a training package that CAI developed. And then we had a really exciting opportunity um, as part of a one-year HRSA Emerging Issues in Maternal Child Health grant, of which CAI was one of seven recipients, we had the opportunity to develop this capacity building, sustainable training package that community health workers could take part in. Um, this again, as Tricia said, includes folks like home visitors and maternal child health programs, promotores de salud, folks who are on the ground with these longer lasting relationships, not the one and done, meet you quickly in the clinic, give you some information, but seeing people over the course of either their pregnancy or postpartum period. The national launch of this training, which I'm gonna talk about briefly, is planned for this September, 2022, following a pilot with some cohorts of geographically diverse home visitors and community health workers, uh, as well as supervisors who will be trained to be able to facilitate this curriculum with their staff. So that was a big part of this sustainability component, was wanting to make sure that supervisors could pick up a curriculum and deliver this with their staff as part of you know, ongoing professional development or as part of a new training tool as staff come on and, and are building these relationships with maternal health clients. So I'm gonna walk through a few of the components of the training. Um, just to give folks kind of a sense of, of what we were thinking about, how we were thinking about the usefulness of this training for those people with their boots on the ground. So the first component is uh, there are three 30-minute online learning modules that we developed, and these are really focused on knowledge acquisition. So these modules introduce community health workers to the content and an overview of the skills that are really going to support their work with mothers in the community. These modules are beautiful, they're engaging, they are self-paced, even though we do estimate that they'll take 30 minutes, you know, people can stop and come into them as needed. Um, they also include some pretty low stakes knowledge checks just to keep people engaged, give them practical opportunities to be able to apply what they're learning to case studies, case scenarios, um, some true false kind of questions. Um, so I'm gonna, talk briefly about what each of the modules does and then what those modules are setting folks up for next. So the first module we titled Maternal Depression and the Role of Community Health Worker. This is kind of a 101 style module and it provides a really comprehensive overview of, again, what maternal depression is and what the role of the community health worker is in supporting clients through conversation, through education, and as Teresha said, in some cases through referrals. This really gets into what community health workers need to know about maternal depression. And it's written in a way that's not overly clinical. It's grounded in clinical research though. The second module we titled Providing Culturally Humble Support for Maternal Depression. This module is the one I think we're feeling most proud about in terms of the thinking and the planning and the consulting that we did with a variety of clinicians and um, folks in this community-based headspace. Um, this really introduces community health workers to the principles of cultural humility and takes a sharp look at the health disparities and issues of access and stigma. Uh, in just a moment, we're gonna kind of go back and take a look at some of the highlights from the module and talk about how health equity is, is discussed and, and how the concept of stigma and cultural thinking about mental health is really something that has to be uh, at the forefront of any community health workers thinking as they approach their relationships with clients. And then the third module is called client-centered communication skills to support maternal mental health. 
So this offers an overview of, again, some of the communication skills that are going to support their work using that mantra uh, that we introduced you to. Things like engagement and rapport building, which are huge. Um, things like being able to ask open-ended questions to affirm clients when community health workers are first meeting with them or having these ongoing visits with them. How to really normalize the experience of maternal depression or stress or you know, just some of the challenges that come with pregnancy and parenting. Um, we also address some fundamental observation skills that community health workers need. This has been tougher in a more virtual world. We've heard from home visitors who've been doing remote visits by phone that it is a lot harder to pick up on red flags and um, it requires a different skill set to do that remotely. But we do see that many of these home visitors and community health workers are returning to in-person work as COVID numbers fortunately decline. And um, so we really do focus on their ability to pick up on cues that something's going on with a mom, something's not quite right, and we need to probe and dig a little deeper. So those three modules are the prerequisites for the second component. The second component is a live six hour training we developed that's focused on practicing and developing those skills further. The live training curriculum could be delivered by a supervisor in person, ideally, uh, or it could be delivered remotely. And we are going to be piloting this twice this spring uh, remotely so that we can access folks from across the country uh, and do that via Zoom. We're working with partners uh, here in New York State where we're based, the New York State Department of Health, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Denver Public Health. Uh, we've also been able to collaborate with the Healthy Start Technical Assistance Center to be able to recruit uh, pilot participants, both in terms of community health workers, as well as supervisors who could be trained in the curriculum. Following that training, we're going to host listening sessions with participants so we can really get a sense of what worked what resonated with people. Um, I see questions coming in and I'm really excited to be able to answer them. Uh, and, and I'll just put in a quick plug that we're still looking for participants for our pilots. So I'll be providing you with my contact information if anybody is thinking, hmm, this is interesting. Um, as I was saying, it's, it's really important that we get a sense of what resonates, what works well. We wanna make sure that, um, you know, we can't we can't customize a training at this point for every culture, every intersection that folks are working with, but we really wanna make sure that it has been vetted in a very robust way with, uh, with people who are working in you know, tribal locations, in Southern states, in Western states, in Eastern states, and in the Midwest. So wherever maternal child health clients and home visiting programs exist. Um, I mentioned that speaking of supervisors, we're going to conduct one training of facilitators um, this summer. So for supervisors of community health workers, and we'll run a similar kind of focus group or listening session uh, following that, that training of facilitators. So again, that by the time we're ready to launch this program nationally, it will have been vetted by the people who are really working in the field. It's designed to be very user-friendly um, with all the bells and whistles in terms of the slides, activities, materials, some great animation videos, um, and really just be ready to pick up and use in a variety of settings. The entire training package, the modules, the curriculum, facilitator's guide, a facilitator's Zoom guide will be available both in English and in Spanish. Um, and they'll be available on CAI's learning management system. We use Moodle as our, as our LMS. That'll be available in September at the end of our grant. And it really is open access. This is a free training program that we want to have out there and want to have community health workers get this training. Um, so we know community health workers know about maternal depression, right? We hear them talking about it. We hear them seeing something's off or I know something's going on with my client. We also know, Teresha talked about all the ways in which community health workers are promoting health equity in really meaningful ways. Um, but we're still seeing these pervasive disparities and gaps in access to clinical support for depression. We have met with clinicians who say, I would move mountains to get billing to work with us a little bit more so that we could take you know, clients who have Medicaid or other, other forms of public insurance 
And it is so cost prohibitive for providers to be able to, to see a wider net of clients. So this is really um, this is really problematic, and it's why we're not resting too heavily on the referral side of things, even though it's important to mention that what we're really talking about here is this need to support and educate. And we know community health workers um, are capable but need to be better equipped to do this work through this lens of cultural humility. And so this training package is designed to support exactly that. So Elizabeth's going to talk about some more concrete ways that we're preparing the community-based workforce to be able to engage in this work. Yes. And yeah, as Claire mentioned, we know that community health workers are perfectly primed to engage in this work at this cultural level and to promote health equity in maternal mental health. They themselves may have experienced maternal depression or have had direct experience with friends or family members experiencing this. So we know that community health workers have a wealth of knowledge and experience and um, values to share with their clients. So again, we want to get you a little participating into the chat and we'll go to the next slide. And I just wanna ask the question, you know, how does culture influence your view of mental health? Or if you're not wanting to share maybe specifically about your view, how does culture influence mental health in general? Love to hear from some folks in the chat. As we said, we really in, in, are uh, in favor of interactive trainings and want to make that here as well, want to have that happen. So how does culture influence your view of mental health? It's a large question. Thank you for getting us started, Andrea or Andrea. Symptom variants. Some cultures experience more somatic symptoms than others. Exactly. Stigmas which prevent moms from speaking up or accessing resources. Exactly. Definitely. How people experience it and whether or not they feel comfortable to say anything to anybody. Stigma, willingness to share about their symptoms. Exactly. Stigma is huge, it's a huge, huge piece of that. We know cultural values can influence the way emotions are expressed. Family history, yeah, Keila, if there's a family history of mental health issues that was not treated or was not respected or there was stigma associated with that, of course. Culture impacts narratives regarding mental health, yes. Jamie, I come from a culture where mental health is not discussed and it is shame and the stigma related to it. So we don't know how to promote, to approach it. Yep. Dismissiveness that comes from some health providers. Definitely, Almutria. Yeah, so, you know, when we don't talk about it, we don't know how to talk about it, right? Sounds pretty obvious, but when we don't know what we don't know, we can't do anything about that. And so we really want to think about ways that we can break that stigma or, or come, come to a place where people feel comfortable to, to bring it up. Not having the right words to describe their experience, or it doesn't translate if English is not their native language exactly, right? So if, especially when symptoms don't align, maybe we say depression is about sadness, whereas some other folks may say depression is about me having a really bad stomach ache or depression is the stress of the day-to-day -day work that I'm going through. And I see Almitria also put in weathering. So therefore we just push through. Yeah, maybe this has kind of become the norm. I think especially with the pandemic that this has become somewhat of the norm to experience um, depression and anxiety and other mental health symptoms. So again, we know that the, our culture has a huge impact on how we view mental health, how others view mental health, how our care, healthcare providers view mental health. And it affects how we communicate about it. You all mentioned that in the chat very clearly. It also affects how communities think about it and how we talk about treatment and if there is treatment available. We know that there's been a history of limited conversation. And so we know in, in specifically in African-American communities that there's little talk about mental health 
because sometimes it can be often seen as a white thing, something that people just don't talk about. It's not a thing. We know often Black women believe and expect that they must be strong or independent and resilient at all times, even if this means hiding past traumas or problems. So Almitria, to your point, that weathering, and so we just push through, exactly. We also know that motherhood is often pegged as like the happiest time in your life. And so when you know people may be experiencing depression during that prenatal or postnatal period, that they may not feel comfortable saying that. Everyone is expecting you to say, I feel great, I'm so excited to be a mom, this is the best time of my life, when we know that that is not the reality for a lot of people. We also know that this is super important, this information, this knowledge around how culture influences mental health. It's really important to share that with community health workers. They might be waiting for a client or someone that they're serving to come out and say, I need help, I'm feeling depressed. So even though that day may not come, at the same time, we know that there is somewhat of a paradigm shift or perspective shift around mental health in the mainstream. And hence why there's so many of us here today at this forum, we're talking about maternal mental health. We're hoping to shift that perspective so that it becomes more normalized and part of our conversation. And so we have the right words to describe it. In you know, mainstream media, we've seen from Naomi Osaka, Simone Biles, and Oprah's interview with Meghan Markle and Prince Harry, more people from communities of color have been talking more openly about mental health. And additionally, we know that there are more resources out there. I think even since the pandemic began, um, that there, there are tons of blog posts out there, online groups, podcasts that have contributed to this cultural shift in talking about mental health difficulties in communities of color. And so, again, we want to highlight how important the role of community health workers have in promoting health equity. And promoting health equity is a huge cornerstone of this project. It's the main reason why we're getting into this work is we want to promote health equity. We want to make sure that people have access to the resources that they need. And this work has really illuminated the pervasive unmet mental health needs among pregnant and postpartum individuals. So we know that maternal depression and anxiety are far from new. We know that the that growing understanding of how harmful it can be is really important to address in that perinatal period. And so one way we as providers and people in the field can address health disparities is through doing these things on the slide here. So identifying what are those health disparities in mental health, incidence, diagnosis, and treatment. So really looking in at the research and saying, why are these numbers the way they are? Is there something we are missing? Is this number of the, the prevalence and the incidence of maternal depression really representative of what's going on in the day-to-day -day lives of people in our communities? Are the rates of diagnosis and treatment accurate? Are people getting diagnosed? Is that happening? Are healthcare providers trained in screening and diagnosing maternal depression or PMADS or whatever we wanna call it? And are people receiving treatment that, that works for them? So we really wanna look at those health disparities and get to the root of those issues. We also want to identify what are the cultural barriers and stigma. You all mentioned that that is a huge piece of how mental health is perceived and culture is a huge piece of who we are as humans, right? That kind of really dictates how we move about the world. And so finally, we really wanna employ some principles of cultural humility. And that is one way in, in one area that community health workers have a really big role. We may not be able to change these larger things of making sure that all healthcare providers are um, you know, screening every single client as they walk through the door, although we hope that that is happening and that will happen in the future. We know that the role of community health workers can really implement these principles of cultural humility. So what is cultural humility? 
It's really approaching clients thoughtfully and really taking care to protect what matters most to them. It's a, an important way to ensure that we're promoting health equity. So employing the principles of cultural humility will allow us to take this approach. So it's really defined as a lifelong process where individuals examine their own beliefs, cultural identities, biases, and values, as well as the beliefs and cultures of others to build respectful relationships regardless of differences. And so using this approach really helps to be successful in asking smart questions to clients, identifying strengths amongst the clients that community health workers work with, and making the most appropriate recommendations, referrals, and delivering information that is meaningful to clients. So cultural humility is different too than cultural competency, which maybe some of you have heard that term as well because we know that cultural humility really relies on the community health worker or the person really doing some reflection, some critical self-reflection and being a lifelong learner. So the four principles of cultural humility, which include being a lifelong learner, that you're open and curious about the client's experience and acknowledging that you may not know everything about that person's culture. You're also a lifelong learner of your own culture. And keeping in mind that everyone has multiple cultural identities and that everyone is unique. Their learning never stops. So even people from the same culture may have different cultural values. And so really keeping that in mind, keeping that curious, open mind, open heart to all of that. When we think about that self-reflection, this is really how cultural humility differs from cultural competency. It's really being able to reflect on your own life, your own culture, and those influences of how you see the world, how the community health worker or the person working with the client really sees the world. It helps you to notice your own biases, judgments, and without judging yourself about it, and how your own experience influences how you see and respond to the client's experience um, of maternal depression. Right? If you have maybe a family history of maternal depression, that may influence how you respond to a client who's also experiencing that. The next principle is acknowledging and working to shift power and balances. So we know that whoever is a part of the majority group will often unconsciously see themselves as the norm. So while those of the minority group are seen as and viewed as the others, as other, so we wanna really address this power dynamic in relationships with clients where the provider or CHW, community health worker, may be seen as the expert that helps and the client is the one who needs help. So shifting these imbalances means really developing relationships where there's mutual respect, empowerment, and trust to build a culture of collaboration and cooperation. We know that clients have power, clients have a, have a lot of knowledge and experience that they bring to the table, just as the CHWs bring as well. You wanna learn with and from your clients. So learning together and from what they have to bring. And again, this can help really to emphasize their strengths and resilience in order to highlight this recognition. Finally, we have the organizational responsibility. So institutions and organizations that we work with, work within, um, are we want to prime them to value diversity of staff and especially leadership to be respectful and supportive um, in their work environments and have opportunities for growth. So this also includes offering cultural, culturally appropriate services for clients, creating strong partnerships with communities that you work with, utilizing resources from practitioners from a range of cultural backgrounds, having cultural, culturally relevant materials and assessments, and providing uh, services that really affirm people's multiple identities. So organizational responsibility is a larger principle on this cultural humility 
that isn't just the work of one CHW, one community health worker. It's the work of everyone within that organization to really disrupt this power dynamic to honor and support people of all different cultures and communities that they're serving. So while these can be implemented and are implemented by community health workers and are highlighted through the modules that Claire discussed, we also know that this work is larger than them. This work is larger than all of us and we wanna all contribute to that work. Um, so that is just kind of a brief, brief overview of cultural humility and the principles. And um, we know that there's a lot of different skills that people can use in order to instill these principles of cultural humility. And so I'll pass it over to Claire to kind of walk us through those. Yes, yes we definitely see one of those aspects of organizational responsibility as taking a look at involving more community health workers in your organizations if you, if you already aren't. Um, we've, we've made this point abundantly clear. We're a big fan of community health workers. I don't need to reiterate that more than we already have probably. Um, but we, we really do appreciate this unique lens that they have in maternal health work and community work. They have this tremendous set of skills that have been shown, as we've said, to improve health outcomes um, for, for mothers, for babies. And we see them as an untapped resource for supporting women in maternal depression. So we're gonna take a look at the set of skills that we really kind of drilled down and focused on helping to develop in the uplifting maternal mental health training we developed. Um, and focusing in on, on how important they are in, in talking about such a stigmatized topic as maternal depression. So the first, and I, I think I would argue almost the most important of the skills, even though we don't always think of it as the most important skill, is this skill of engagement. In looking at a lot of different models for home visiting and case management, especially you know, how things have changed since COVID, we thought about everything we knew about why engagement and rapport is so, so important in this work, particularly when raising the issue of mental health and maternal depression specifically. We know in some cases, home visitors are making, you know, two or th three or four visits um, with clients. In other settings, they have much more long lasting relationships with clients. Um, but it's important to think about how few people would open up about their mental health with a total stranger if they saw that that stranger was a fleeting presence in their life, that they were only going to have one or maybe two chances to talk with them. Um, and, and that's a good thing that that individuals kind of contain what they share when they are first interacting with a total stranger. It's, it's an act of self-preservation, I might argue. But engagement is critical in establishing and building rapport and trust. And, and that's whether you have three visits or you have 30 visits with someone. This is, this is ongoing, it's not one and done. It's really built and sustained on this foundation of hope and mutual trust and respect and effective communication and recognition of somebody's strengths and efforts and all the resources that people experiencing depression are bringing to their recovery. As Elizabeth and Tricia talked about, maternal depression is a highly stigmatized subject. And in many communities, especially communities of color, maternal depression is not discussed or accepted. And it can really create rifts and even put women and their families at risk of alienation from their communities. So a skillful community health worker can meet a pregnant client or a new mother, be able to ask about their lives, ask about their pregnancy, ask about their baby in a conversational, non-threatening sort of way and not come charging out of the gate with an assessment or a screener tool talking about depression. That's really fundamentally important. This other term up on the screen, rapport building, um, this is really the, the beauty of engaging home visitors and community health workers in supporting maternal mental health is their ability to build rapport. Uh, these folks have unique relationships with clients. They often have a deep awareness of the cultures and communities in which their clients live. They have ongoing relationships and an ability to support clients in ways that a more formal or traditional healthcare system can't always. So trusting and respectful relationships are the basis for recovery. There is a hyper scrutinization of communities of color, uh, particularly low-income communities, 
and really grave concern about who's knocking on their door, who's asking questions. Um, there's fear of who might get involved, um, you know, fear of judgment if they have some dirty dishes in the sink or some laundry on the floor. And so without that crucial skill of developing trust and rapport with clients, it's extremely challenging to have impactful conversations about a mother's mental health. I'm just gonna name and not go into great detail around some of the observation skills. And we talked about these kind of verbal and non-verbal cues that might come up that could raise some red flags. Uh, we've, we've met with a number of doulas and community health workers who've been in this work for a long time. And they've talked about how this is a learned skill like anything. It's something that people become much more equipped to notice and sort of circle back to the longer they are in this work. But it's really crucial to, to support better communication and aid in um, you know, being able to probe or say, you know, I, I've noticed this or I've seen this or I've heard you mention this now a couple of times. Can we go back to that? Can we talk a little bit about what, what's going on? How are you feeling? Um, communication skills, I'm also not going to go into great detail. I know many of you are very familiar with the skills and have trained people in these skills yourselves. But you know, again, things like open-ended questions and probing the ability to normalize a situation, normalize and validate someone's feelings, um, to affirm someone for their efforts. Teresha, Elizabeth, and I have a colleague who was sharing with us recently that uh, several decades ago when she was a teen mother, she had a home visitor come shortly after her baby was born. And she was terrified because she had a sink full of dirty dishes. She was terrified of the scrutiny and the judgment that this home visitor might have about her situation. And the one thing that she said the home visitor did that immediately put her at ease was just to affirm her for all that she was doing, all that she had been figuring out in these early days of parenthood. And just to have this person who you feared was, was judging you sort of lay out front I'm so impressed by everything you're doing, or I'm so impressed that you're even standing up and answering the door for this home visit, really tilted that visit and expectations for future visits on its head. Um, we also talk a lot about active and reflective listening and, and how a community health worker who's working across a lot of different cultures, as we talked about, can hear what's going on and be able to reflect on that and make sure with the client that they're hearing the right thing, that they're getting the, the information correctly. And then this final skill on the slide around framing the issue, this is a big one too. This is what we kept hearing from community health workers is they know something's going on, but they don't always have the confidence to be able to talk with clients frankly and sensitively and with cultural humility about what they're experiencing, particularly for community health workers who are sometimes using screening tools and should be able to talk about what the tool is, why it's used, and what are the results? What, what's the meaning behind this? Um, community health workers do get to practice these communication skills in, in an interactive way in the training we put together um, using real life scenarios. They get to practice framing the issue of maternal depression. Um, you know, weaving in educational messages, um, being able to do so without necessarily naming the topic of maternal depression or what they're looking for, so that it feels effortless. It doesn't feel like it's, it's overly clinical or overly textbook. Um, as I said, sometimes community health workers are involved in screening protocols. And for anyone here who's delivered a mental health screener, you know, it's not always an easy thing to do. Um, and, and some of us, I'm sure, have observed it being done not always in a very effective way, in a leading way, or a way that can um, not always make someone feel safe in opening up. One of the most challenging parts of a community health worker's job is bringing up those conversations about what they're observing or what they see the numbers on a screener indicating. So our training really is gonna support community health workers in being able to talk about health screenings they're using, to be transparent about what they are, how they're used, and ensure that they're getting the most honest responses to questions about maternal health, maternal depression. So uh, as I mentioned, this pilot that is coming up quickly is something that we are really, really excited about. Um, we're looking forward to rolling out the training package and seeing you know, what the initial impact is, as well as using this approach in the way that we offer trainings and 
capacity yeah. building um, moving forward. We have learned so much in the development of this training and um, getting to you know check in with folks who supervise community health workers now um, as part of the development process. And it's really making us look with a more critical eye around how we could implement some of these things with other trainings we do. Um, we've engaged in some, some other work around perinatal mood and anxiety disorders or PMADs with multidisciplinary teams from physicians and nurses to home visitors and doulas. So we're looking forward to a lot more work there. Um, and in terms of kind of what's next for us or some promising practices, some things that we see coming up, we are really thrilled to see more attention being paid to maternal depression and the uplifting of national organizations that are focused on uh, Black, Indigenous um, clients, people of color, uh, organizations like Shades of Blue and NAMI and the Loveland Foundation. Postpartum Support International has developed some fantastic tools and training and resources and forums like the one that we are all taking part in today. Uh, in our home state of New York, we see incredible strides um, in, in moving the dial and, and being able to address maternal health. And we also still see enormous barriers, especially um, in terms of reimbursement barriers for mental health care and a lack of, of referral sources. That is something that comes up over and over. Um, so we see as a, as a promising practice, more advocacy for better Medicaid reimbursement for mental health. Um, we've seen some creative solutions like support groups that if providers aren't necessarily able to take private clients with Medicaid insurance for their one-to-one -one, um, consultations and visits, they are sometimes able to, to put together some support groups and have peers be a big part of leading those support groups. We see some tremendous peer support programs cropping up around the country um, that can look like a lot of different things and be very, very effective. We see all of these as complementing the work that community health workers are doing. Um, and we're encouraged to see more and more implicit bias training happening across healthcare sectors. So there's lots of good movement and we're excited to be a big part of it. So at this point, we have some time. I am gonna put my email into the chat. I saw a few people asking for it um, or wanting to, to learn a little bit more about the uplifting maternal mental health training for community health workers. So I'm putting that into the chat. I can do that at the end as well. Um, and then I just would love my colleagues to help me out with some of the questions that might've come in in the chat. And we have some time to take some, some additional questions from you all. So um, please throw those into the chat if you have any. Actually, I see not questions, but these were all responses, phenomenal responses to that question around how culture impacts our thinking about mental health. So a big thank you. Are there any questions about the training or the, the work and the research we've done around um, cultural humility and, and further engaging of community health workers and home visitors in this work? Hi, Claire. Um, my name is Andrea Agalico. I'm a social worker in Washington, DC, working at a nonprofit. Um, we do have some community health workers on our staff. I was just wondering um, if there was like, a web URL or like, fact sheets or anything about the, the programs that you're talking about with uplifting maternal mental health in the trainings. Hi, Andrea. Thanks. Uh, we have some language for um, our registration link. We have not advertised this widely on our CAIglobal.org website because we're still in that pilot phase. And so, of course, once the national launch happens September 1st, um, there will be much more language on our website so that people can access that. And we're excited to partner with um, HRSA and Healthy Start to be able to um, link this training and make sure people are aware of it. Um, Andrea, feel free to drop your email into the chat and I can send you some direct language. This goes for anyone um, who joined us for today's session. Um, and thank you, Andrea. And I'll absolutely send that today.
Uh, I see thank a question. You. Yeah, thank you. I see a question about whether these services will all be funded through HRSA or other grants. So this was one this the development of the online learning modules and this training for community health workers was 100% funded by this one year grant through HRSA. Um, we saw some some exciting projects again there were seven grantee recipients um, for this emerging maternal health grant um, kind of all over the map in terms of the, the work that we were doing. Um, but this was entirely HRSA funded. Good afternoon. My name is Teresa and I work in Peoria, Illinois. I work for Family Connects International. We are a home visiting maternal newborn service for Peoria County. I personally have a mother that went through a very traumatic delivery. I know that she at some point when she's able to kind of focus on it will um, go through some PTSD. Unfortunately, she has been readmitted twice since pregnancy due to a complication that happened during her pregnancy. So what type of advice would you give me um, preemptively um, to kind of help her? Um, you know, I am currently involved with her partner, um, the father of her baby, just kind of helping them kind of go through this crisis, family crisis they're in now, but I know that she will be suffering again, physically, emotionally, and mentally from everything she's going through. And when she gets to the other side, I want to make sure that she has the help that she needs. So I know that's a big question, but any, any advice would be greatly appreciated. Thank you for your time. Thanks. That's unfortunately something we're hearing a lot about. Um, I had mentioned that some of the work we're engaging in around PMAD training for these multidisciplinary teams, including community health workers, doulas. Um, we have a, a really phenomenal group in New York City called the Birth Justice Defenders that are helping to highlight some of these really unfortunate birth events that leave people scarred. And one one aspect of this PMED work that I think we have a much better understanding of is how birth trauma is, is part of that. It's, you know, we're looking at depression, anxiety, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, psychosis, but we're also looking at the impact of trauma and not just birth trauma, but trauma from um, adverse uh, medical interactions or, um, you know, the impact of, of racism in hospitals that's really leaving people traumatized. So I think that there's more focus on this, which bodes well for the future. I'm certainly gonna encourage my, my clinician colleague, Elizabeth, to jump on, but I think a, a big piece of what we're focused on is not just the referrals, although referrals to things like peer support programs or being able to link clients or patients up with others who've experienced and healed or are healing from adverse birth events um, can be really powerful. There are support groups, there are more and more virtual support groups available that aren't necessarily geographically bound now. Um, and I think a big part, you know, I'm not a clinician, but a big part of processing what happened is being able to talk about it with people who are going to listen, really affirm people for their, their ability to, to talk about tough issues, um, and hopefully be able to link to, to some clinical mental health care beyond that. Elizabeth, I wonder if you would add anything to that response. I think you hit a lot of the really important pieces around that. Um, you know, I think just reiterating how important and how valuable someone to talk to, someone just that's listening there can be so important. If that may be tricky too, there's different, um, I know Postpartum Support International has a warm line or a hotline. Um, so different areas where they can, or different people that they can talk to at different points, if it may not be someone that they have directly in front of them. Um, so there's different resources online, which is great, whether it's, as Claire mentioned, you know, kind of online support groups, um, 
different other resources online. And, you know, if, if they do need, you know, more intensive support, then to um, guide them to that. When making referrals, we always encourage what we call a warm handoff, that it's not just giving them a flyer for here's the mental health services, go figure it out yourself, that you're really um, engaging in that process of transitioning them or, or transferring them to that care if they need a higher level of care. But yeah, to never, I, you know, yeah, go for it, Teresha. No, I just wanted to add, I also want to add that, you know, don't sell yourself short because I hear that you have that intimate relationship and that connection with that client, right? And the most important thing that you're doing already is supporting her and, and being and the fact that, you know, you're thinking about the client and, and, and this kind of brings it back to the four mantra, the verbs that I was talking about earlier, you know, you identifying, supporting, and you're trying to educate your client. And of course, like Elizabeth and Claire shared, you know, there's some type of referral that can be added to that. And that's amazing. And don't sell yourself short because it sounds like, you know, you, you are doing a lot for that client. Any other questions? Thank you for all of you who've dropped uh, emails into the chat. Elizabeth just posted, we, we're we tracking them all diligently and we'll send some information following today, today's forum session. Yeah, thank you, Dana, for dropping the link into um, into the chat for, for Postpartum Support International. It's, it's an organization we can't speak highly enough about. Well, great. Thank you, Thunk. Thank you. Hopefully we've left you with a few minutes to take a little stretch break and grab something to eat or drink before the next exciting session. Uh, we loved the interactions and all that you shared and your ideas around uh, culture and, and discussion of mental health. So this was really fun for us to take part. Thank you all. And also, if there's anything you want to share with us that you may think that we can add on, we want to hear from you too. Right on. Email us. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the forum. We look forward to connecting with you. <laughs>